Screw, 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 screw. Hey, ninth grade. It's Mr. Borchard back here with you again in the online Bible classes. I've got in my peripheral the agenda for day number 25, okay? Uh, so if you don't have that up, you need to have it up right now. I've got it up, and we're going to go over some stuff. Before we go over our specific agenda, though, I have a few things to share with you. If you have not seen the videos I'm about to reference, then when I'm done explaining these videos, you need to pause this one and go find the links for the other ones. They're going to be in the, the same place where you found the links for this video, okay? Uh, so, we've got uh, one thing to look at is the assignment submission video. Uh, I was a little overwhelmed with emails, getting emails back for homework that was submitted, and so I've come up with an alternative way to submit your, um, your homework. So, uh, please watch that and see how to properly submit your homework. Something else is you need to make sure that you are watching all the lecture videos. I understand this may be boring for you. I understand this is not as entertaining as having your friends around uh, you can crack jokes with. I understand, but you need to be on top of watching these lectures. Um, it'll pass the time. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it'll pass the time slower. I don't know. But uh, you, you still need to watch it as part of your instruction. Okay, You're mandated by the government to be in school, and this is your school time. Uh, one thing we're, we're looking at here also is uh, I'm going to try, we'll see, we'll see how things are received. I'm going to try to have a fun video posted each week for our students, for you guys. Um, and uh, if it depends on you know, how things are going. If, if they ended up not being that great, then I just won't do them anymore. Uh, but go, go watch that video as well. And something else is each week, beginning of each week, I'm going to be sending out emails that have the links to all these videos, and it's going to have probably a list of homework assignments that need to be submitted. So you need to see those emails, and it's just going to be sent to whatever email we have on file, whether that be your email or your parents' email, okay? Um, and so, uh, for now, you should pause this video and go watch those if you haven't already. I'll wait. All right. Hey, I'm back now. You're back now. And uh, one of the first things that we're starting off here is, is I actually want to go over the homework on our agenda. So we've got our vocab and definitions. It says you need to write out in your own words, on your own paper. Um, you, you may do that. You may also use the homework submission uh, thing that I've done that you now learned about from the homework submission video. Uh, also, the DQs. you got to finish the DQs, the World of Ideas discussion questions. And you'll also need to read Light Bearers, page 244 to 247. Um, and uh, that'll be the last of the reading for, for this. We'll have some more reading later, but that'll be the rest of that section. And uh, we also have next the Purpose and Plan exercise. For that exercise, you'll turn to page 259 in your book. You'll read the instructions, and you'll complete the assignment. Okay? Uh, next class, we have a vocab quiz. As said in the introduction video weeks ago, uh, you may take quizzes and tests, open book, and open note. Okay. For now, please go ahead and pause this video and get on to your devotional, which is Heidelberg Catechism, day number four. Okay, if you're back, then that means you have finished going through the Heidelberg Catechism for day number four. And the next thing we're going to do is uh, pull up the chapter 10, part 2 PowerPoint. Okay, that's listed there in your day 25 materials. I've got mine up, and I expect you to have yours up, and you would are going to have to follow along. Okay? All right, so I've got this here. I'm right on the very introduction one where it says LB chapter 10, part 2. And now I'm going to the next slide, and it starts off with the historical reliability of the Gospels. Oh, yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to wear a hat for this one because this is one of my favorite subjects in the world, okay? 
um, the historical reliability of the Bible as a whole, but this is specifically talking about the Gospels, okay? Skeptics often say that the Bible just cannot be true. Um, and, and, and so what I hope is that through the next few slides, the next few minutes of this video, um, that we will show you what is some internal evidence as provided by the textbook and uh, also maybe even some external evidence down the road to, sh to show the reliability of the Gospels. Um, and we're trying to prove the historicity of the Gospels. Okay, We've talked about this a little bit in the past, but I'm going to refresh your mind. Okay, When I say historicity, what I mean is we're going to look at the evidence within the Bible itself in order to determine its reliability as a source of accurate historical information. So when we say we're looking at its historicity, we're saying we're trying now to determine its validity as a reliable historical document. Okay? I'm now transitioning to page number two, excuse me, slide number th three. Slide number three. Evidence number one. The authors of the Gospels themselves were people who were very, very interested in history, okay? And the goal of the New Testament authors was to preserve the history of what actually took place. It was not in their benefit to record inauthentic historical things. They wanted to preserve what actually took place. And they knew what would have been the difference between the facts and the myths. Believe it or not, at the time of the early church, there were a lot of myths about Jesus that were circulating. Um, one of the myths comes from uh, a, a heresy called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism would venture to say that uh, um, it would venture to say that uh, many things about Jesus. One, of the, one branch of Gnosticism said that Jesus was not uh, a real person. He just looked like a real person, okay? Um, and so these authors who wrote the books would have known the fact from the fiction uh, because some Gnostics said Jesus wasn't a real person. He was just a, kind of a ghost. He looked like a real guy, and he didn't actually die. Um, so uh, I want you guys to quickly pause the video and look up 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, as well as the other verses listed there. And each time that we have Bible verses referenced in the PowerPoint, or maybe you have it over here, or wherever you have it. Uh, every time we have those listed, I'm going to need you to look those up and read those in your own Bible. Just pause the video and read those. Uh, so, the authors of the New Testament Gospels placed a great value on eyewitness testimony. And this is critical in getting the facts from the myths. Okay, if we go around talking to people uh, about something about an event that they were never there to witness themselves, then who knows what kind of stuff they're actually telling us. If I ask my friend uh, about a wedding that he went to, and I ask, hey, how did the wedding go? You know, what were some of the cool songs? Or how did the, how did the wedding go? And he tells me, this, the wedding went like this, and like this, and like this. And then I talk to someone else who didn't go to the wedding, and he's telling me how the wedding was. Who am I going to believe? the person who went to the wedding, or the person who didn't go to the wedding. I'm going to take the word of the person who actually went to the event and witnessed it over the person who just knows things by hearsay. Okay, uh, So I'm going to value the eyewitness over the non-witness, over the regular guy who's just over here doing weird things. All right. So the authors similarly placed really, really high value onto eyewitness testimony. And we can see that in the Gospels. That portrays itself. That is shown in the Gospels um, because apostles themselves in the Bible, okay, biblically speaking, according to the Bible, in the Bible, an apostle is someone who had to have seen Jesus and been with Jesus under the tutelage or the training of Jesus. And so, if we read the following verses here, Luke 1, 1-4, 2 Peter, 1 John, going on forward, then we can see 
uh, all these different things happening, okay? Uh, so that's evidence number one. The authors were people who were very interested in the actual history. They had a lot writing on the line, and they wanted it to be accurate. I'm now on the next slide, slide number four. This is evidence number two. The authors were accustomed to remembering details. And this is one that I'm going to have to spend a little bit more time on, and as such, I'm going to have to switch the position of my hat because it was, it was really hurting my forehead. Um, the authors were people who were accustomed to remembering details. Here's, here's how I live. This is me, Mr. Borchard. Here's how I live. When I have something that I need to remember, I jot, I jot it down in my phone, okay? If I have an, uh, something that I need to be at, I pull up my calendar app, I put it in my calendar, and then it reminds me for me, okay? And you and I have become very spoiled with this. We can write things down. We have paper readily available to us. We have electronics that prompt us when something is coming up. And so we are always being reminded of things. But people at that time did not have that luxury. And they had to rely on their memory more than anything else. And so uh, the Gospels were written by men with a good memory for details. But that was not specific to the authors themselves. That was a characteristic of most people alive at that time. Um, that's a, just a cultural difference between the first century uh, then and our way of living now. It's just different. People at that time had highly developed memories, and that contrasts to our world where we just look things up and we don't remember them. Um, also, another important thing here, when it comes to the memory of the, of the disciples and the apostles, uh, Jesus often taught and spoke in poetic form, okay? We can look at one example, which is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. It is poetically and systematically written out. Um, and, and it would have been very easy for someone to have sat down and memorized the outlines of what Jesus said in various occasions, and then produce them later on to document. Another big cultural difference uh, between now and the way things were back then, for uh, a, a, as a Jewish child, um, people pretty much had three options. If you were a girl, it was your responsibility to follow your mother and learn from your mother and learn how to take care of the home. If you were a boy you were put into school until the age of 13 or so, okay? And um, once you hit 13, your career either went one of two ways. Either you were one of the top percentage of intelligence, and you're very smart, and you went to learn under the rabbi further to be your own rabbi one day, or you were an average guy, you were maybe smart but not as smart, or maybe you were just a little bit slow uh, and, and hard to understand things. And so then you'd follow in the footsteps of your father in the trade that he was in. Okay, And so uh, when we look at a person like Jesus, uh, he had the skills of his father, like most people would have back then. Uh, his father was a carpenter. And also he was a person uh, who, was, uh, who had gone through the necessary training and education to be a rabbi himself. Jesus' disciples, remember, they're, they're all men. His apostles, the apostles, his disciples were all men, and they had the, the, the two options. They were the cut above, or they were not as bright as the cut above. And um, so Jesus' disciples, which one do you think they came from? The, 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 the cut above or the less intelligent? You would think that they would have come from the cut above. Normal circumstances would have meant that they were the people who were extremely intelligent. However, if you remember the story of how Jesus recruited his, his disciples, uh, they were actually this group over here. They were this group of people who had a hard time with studying and who were not the most intelligent. And yet, Jesus called them, and for some of them, he came up to them while they were fishing, which was their trade, and he says, I'm calling you to be a fisher of men. And so Jesus pulled them into his ministry and taught them. Um, Jesus was a teacher. 
and students under the teaching of a rabbi, rabbi is just a word for teacher, were expected to remember the lessons taught to them, and they may have uh, used some note-taking methods, but by and large, those who were following under the teaching of a rabbi were expected to just remember every lesson verbatim oh, in their mind. They just had to remember. And if they didn't remember something, they just tried harder. Uh, one, of, one of the ways that people would, uh, a kid who was a cut above, who was taken under a rabbi at the age of 13, he'd go live with the rabbi and literally he would mimic every single thing about the rabbi. If the child was right-handed, but the rabbi was left-handed, the child would learn to write with his left hand. If the rabbi had a certain way of walking, the student was expected to exactly mimic the way that man walked for the rest of his life. Um, and so everything like that, every detail of that rabbi, that student became, and that's how they passed down knowledge through generations um, let's look at the next slide here, slide number five, titled Evidence 3. It says here, the Gospels were written within a generation of the events. This is important. It would become less reliable if the Bible was written 100, 200, 300 years after Jesus. If the Bible was written and documented several hundred years or seven, even several generations after the events themselves, that would make it less reliable, okay? It's, you, would, you would have to wonder, you know, how much integrity has been lost. But the Bibles were written within the generation, so that means the people who learned under Jesus were the same guys, were around the same guys uh, who wrote the, the books themselves. Here's some incorrect logic. This is a common logical point that people use. It's incorrect. Uh, it's called circular reasoning. Circular reasoning is when you take uh, an idea um, and you produce a conclusion and you reference the idea. Here's an example. The Gospels were written many, many generations after Jesus and therefore cannot be trusted because miracles don't happen and Jesus seemed to know about the fall of Jerusalem, which happened after his death. Knowing the future would be a miracle, therefore no miracles happened. Okay, let me rephrase this. Um, a circular, an example of circular logic would say would be to say, I don't believe that miracles exist. Looking into the future uh, and knowing the future is a miracle. Therefore, uh, looking into uh, the future is not, a, is not a miracle because miracles don't exist. It's, it's using your conclusion of an argument to be drawn from something you've already stated to support the argument. We'll get into that a lot in 10th grade. I don't expect you to fully understand that now. Um, but the books of the Gospels, all of them were written in 60 AD, in the 60s AD. Okay, and We know that they were written before 70 AD. 70 AD is when the fall of Jerusalem happened, and surely, if the fall of Jerusalem had happened by the time that these Gospels were written, then the authors would have mentioned that it actually did fall. But they didn't mention that, because that would have been a huge, major event, and yet the authors did not specifically mention it. They mentioned Jesus' prophecies that, um, that uh, Jerusalem would go through crazy times, but they did not actually say that, that it actually happened, and they would have, most likely. Let's go ahead and, and look at the next video now. You'll see here that I've got a, a video for you to watch. So at the conclusion of this video, you'll watch this video. Alternatively, if you don't want to watch any more videos, you can just read the article at that same web location, and it's kind of a rundown of what that video has to say. Um, but let me pray for you, then you can go ahead and close this video and watch that next one. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for our ninth grade students at James Valley Christian School. I pray that they... Are, are kept growing both uh, emotionally and intellectually and physically and that they are strong and remain healthy through this time when it seems like we can't do anything but sit around inside the house. Um, so Lord, I pray that as time goes on that they would continue to also grow spiritually, that they would grow to reflect you. 
and that they, I, I pray that you'd put the burden on their heart to help around the house, to clean the dishes, to clean their room, to pick up after brother and sister and to do so joyfully. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.